first, before I go through what I've prepared to talk about, obviously we've all uh, seen the reports and the video coming out of Moscow. This uh, violent shooting at a, looks like a shopping mall. Um, can't speak much to the details of it. I mean, this was all just breaking before I came on out here. So we're uh, trying to get uh, more information, but uh, really would refer to uh, Russian uh, authorities to, to speak to it. Uh, the images are just horrible um, and uh, just hard to watch. And our thoughts obviously are going to be with the, the victims of this terrible, terrible shooting attack. Um, and I think, you know, you, you look at that video if you have and you got to recognize that there's some moms and dads and brothers and sisters and sons and daughters that haven't gotten the news yet and this is going to be a tough day um, so our thoughts are with them um, you might have also seen hopefully you saw our state the state department or embassy there uh, put out a notice to all americans uh, in moscow to avoid any large gathering concerts obviously shopping malls anything like that uh, just for their own safety they should uh, they should stay put where they are and stay plugged into the State Department for any additional updates and information. You're still gathering information, but do you have any sense whether this could be linked at all to the conflict in Ukraine? There is no indication at this time that Ukraine uh, or Ukrainians were involved in the shooting. But again, it's just both. We'll take a look at it, but I would disabuse you at this early hour of anything. Hello, everyone. This is Alex with Bridging News, and we are here on a breaking news day. It's been a very difficult day for the country of Russia, its citizens. Many families have been affected by this unbelievable event. We've decided to come to you live on YouTube, on Rumble, Twitter, X, and many other platforms. Our guests tonight are geopolitical analysts and People that really can help us cope with what has happened here in the last 24 hours. Uh, I bring on to the program Carl Zaw. Welcome to the program, Carl. Thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, Hi, without Alex. further ado, uh, Angelo Giuliano. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been a quite an interesting um, 24 hours. I know at approximately 3:30 in the morning China time last night, my phone was ringing off the hook from our uh, distinguished partners uh, RT who we all know, uh, had called me and said, um, there's some big news, Alex, we need your insight. And I'm sure you gentlemen have also uh, added to that. Um, Carl, when you first heard of the news, uh, your thoughts on this matter, what was going through your mind? And then we'll go over to Angelo. Well, I received a call at 7 a.m. in the morning from our friends in RT. I was in shock. Uh, because I was in actually in Moscow last year in the summer. I really enjoy the atmosphere. People are friendly. And, uh, you know, this could have been me if I was in Russia uh, doing the sightseeing. And it's the the news just got from bad to worse because the, as the death toll keep rising, I think now uh, it's almost 100 people dead and over 100 wounded. And uh, the good thing is they have a pre they have a pre apprehended several of the perpetuator. So we are I mean, it's a good uh, we have a good possibility to get to the bottom of this. Well, thank you for sharing that. We're going to move over to Angelo. Angelo, your thoughts when you first uh, read and heard of the news. Well, quite shocking. Uh, I think we need to look at the first reactions uh, pointing the collective was pointing at uh, ISIS. I think that was an easy one. Uh, we we know who, who's uh, behind ISIS, but uh, it seems like the last news that actually we are going to share together, it seems like uh, they are more and more pointing at Ukraine. So that is, I think it's uh, it might be dramatic for the uh, uh, possible potential escalation against Ukraine. But I, I think that uh, here we have a leader, a Russian leader, who is very pragmatic, he's not emotional, he's going to take his actions in due time. Uh, and it's going to be very measured, uh, but he's not, you see, I have the impression that the collective West, whoever is behind this, I, and I think 
the directions are pointing at the US and directly through proxies. Uh, this, they want to elicit a, a response from Putin. And I think Putin is going to be measured. He's not going to give the, the same response that the West is expecting. He's going according to his own term, own pace. Uh, and I think this is, uh, it is, it should not, it, it's not going to affect in any way what is happening on the ground in Ukraine. Your thoughts, gentlemen? Carl, we're going to pass it over to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 top, the Euro suspect, you know, you, either Ukraine or ISIS, but it doesn't really matter because both are Western proxies. You know, I, it, it, it's, it's interesting that we would have the ISIS claiming responsibility at this point. Now, now this is in particular time uh, since October, there has been a genocide committed in, in, on Gaza, yet ISIS is attacking Russia. You know, isn't it weird that ISIS is not attack, attacking targets in U.S. and Israel, but chose at this opportunity in time to attack Russia? And and the U and what makes it more dodgy is the U.S. Uh, embassy actually issued a travel warning uh, uh, two weeks before on March 7th. They, they warned American citizens to stay away from crowded places, from malls, and particularly from concerts, from going to concert halls. And, and now we just have the report from CBS News where uh, U.S., I guess a U.S. intelligence official spoke to the CBS News and confirmed that this U.S. embassy issued a warning because the U.S. intelligence supposedly have the intelligence of the pending attack and they have supposedly warned Russian government. Now, uh, but yet right after this terrible incident happened, we have John Kirby, the spokesperson for the White House, came out and say, well, right now it's too early to attribute this to any political motivation. Well, OK, if you don't know anything, just say that you don't know anything. Why would you then speculate that it's not politically motivated, especially when just last week, John Kirby has issued the warning himself about Americans to stay away from a large uh, gathering of crowds and uh, malls and concert halls. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 to me, it's very suspicious, especially with the timing. This is right after the successful re-election of Putin. Putin just received an overwhelming mandate to prosecute the, basically the special military operation in Ukraine. And they, he's elected for another six years. And at the same time, Russia is clearly winning on the battlefield of Ukraine. And there's nothing Ukraine or its Western backers could do about it. So this would seem like a desperate attempt by either, uh, you know, either of these Western proxies to, you know, to deal a blow to the morale of Russian people. But I think if this is going to be backfire. I mean, it, like a tragedy of, of this magnitude is going to pull people together. You already see people in Moscow; they're lining up to donate blood uh, uh, and 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 try whatever they can to help the victims. So I, I and 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 I believe Putin just went on the Russian television to give a speech, and the designated. Okay. Um <laughs> Lights out. No problem, Carl. We'll, we'll see you in a moment. Um, so I'm just going to add to this. Uh, Carl, we'll come back to you in a second there. Um, uh, Angelo, let me read something to you. I'm not sure if you've actually read it, but you've definitely tweeted about it already today. And your Twitter is your, your Twitter and your ex is on fire. This was official from the U.S. Embassy and the government of the United States dated March 7th. Location, Moscow, Russia. Listen up, viewers. This is very important to hear these details. This wasn't March 21st or March 19th. Detailed, very detailed here. March 7th, right? That's a couple of weeks ago. The embassy is monitoring reports that extremists, this is what was put on the warning here. Once again, this is from the U.S. Embassy. Warning its citizens in Russia, the embassy is monitoring reports that extremists have imminent plans to target large gatherings in Moscow. 
They point out Moscow. They don't just say Russia or, you know, areas around Russia. And we know there's a conflict going on there. So they've gone out of their way to really focus in razor sharp on this. It's kind of like, well, I told you so, but I didn't really tell you everything. Okay, and I'm going to continue with this. Once again, imminent plans to target large gatherings in Moscow to include... I'm not making this up. You can go immediately to the U.S. Embassy government page. Well, it's still up. Okay, well, it's still up. Large gatherings in Moscow to include concerts. And U.S. citizens should be advised to avoid large gatherings over the next 48 hours. Um, this is not a coincidence. Uh, Angelo, right here, two weeks ago, in writing on a U.S. Embassy government website, warning people in Moscow, if you knew so much to say that the embassy is monitoring reports from extremists, did you share that information with the Russian government to avoid this deadly massacre? Or is there a lot more to that statement than meets the eye? Angelo, tell us. Well, it is obvious here, it's not about uh, who pulls the trigger. It's uh, the one that actually is controlling. Unfortunately, the U.S. is behind. Is behind. Actually, when you look at terrorism, just the, just the historic uh, of uh, terrorism, who has actually created terrorism in the world? Uh, very often, you will see actually the, the U.K., you had Mossad, you had uh, the, the U.S., uh, those are the 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 one that pretty much invented ter terrorism. Uh, ISIS. When you look at the the who was behind the creation of ISIS, Al Qaeda, was always the U.S. It, it is uh, ISIS is uh, Mossad uh, alongside the, with the CIA. So they were creators of the of those uh, terrorist cells. So now, why Moscow and why now? What is the situation right now in Ukraine? In Ukraine, we are close to collapse of the front. Now they need to do a di diversion. And uh, what is happening right now is that we saw, for example, Tucker Carlson and actually even Carl Zah, he went, he went to Moscow. And guess what? Moscow is business as usual. The economy is doing well. Everything is peaceful. And what they want to do to those terrorist attacks is actually to install, uh, it's like the strategy of tension. You want to create tension in Russia because it's very highly frustrating, and they, they need those small wins. They think it's a small win, but in reality, it's 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 uh it's bad for their cause. It's uh, highlighting what we all knew all along that this Ukraine Nazi regime, because that's what they are. They are Nazis in Ukraine. Uh, terrorists. And this is not the first time. I don't know if you remember. Uh, they tried to kill Dugin. Alexander Dugin, and, uh, and and there were lots of attacks of, uh, of uh, citizens, terrorist attacks of uh, Russian citizens uh, all along, perpetrated by Ukrainians. So that would be not be the first time. And we saw the last news. Maybe we can go into this. Uh, the last news is that the one that they, the asylums, those terrorists, they, they were actually heading back to Ukraine. And maybe you can give us some updates, uh, Alex. Uh, yeah. they, how many did they, they catch, and uh, what is the connection with Ukraine we have so far? So we're reading the bottom ticker tape below us here, and welcome back to the program, Carl. Sorry about that technical issue there. Great to have you back here. Um, we're reading uh, that it's 11 uh, at the moment, but that number seems to be growing. In fact, that we've just received some footage here um, that I'm going to play on... <laughs> I don't wish this upon anyone, but uh, this is one of the um, terrorists. Uh, we did, uh, of course, blur out his image uh, just to be careful. Um, but this is a country that you do not want to commit this crime to. They're, they will not allow you to go in there, slaughter their citizens, and then hide behind a lawyer and maybe get out on bond and then maybe, uh, maybe, just maybe, uh, be taken to court at a later date, um, clean shaven. No, this is how Russia does it when they deal with people. And let's have a look. 
When did you arrive from Turkey? Just wait for this to load, gentlemen. What did you do in Turkey? Okay, there it is. When did you arrive from Turkey? What did you do in Turkey? My documents expired, so I crossed the border. Once again, your full name. Uh, year of birth, 1998. What did you do in Krakus yesterday? What did you do in Krakus? I was shooting. You were shooting? You were shooting who? Why? For money. Money? Let's put him up. For how much money? Some 500 thousand, five hundred thousand of what, of rubles? Did you get it from who? I have received only one half. It was transferred to my card. Where's your card? He gave it and it was in my clothes, in my jacket, so I lost it. Where did you get weapons? They gave it to us. Who they? I don't know who they. They texted me on Telegram without names, without anything. How did they find you? You found them or they found you? They texted me. Why did they text you in particular? I don't know. I was listening to... But how come they just offer you to kill people out of thin air? It doesn't happen like this. What was on Telegram? I was listening to a prophet, to a sermon. You were listening to sermons, and uh, who texted you? Assistant of a preacher. What's his name? No name, no last name, no nothing. They just texted me. When did they text you? A month ago, who texted you exactly? He texted me, he promised me one million rubles. What did he promise you? What, he, what did he want from you? He offered me and I agreed. What did he offer? He offered money. For what? Money for what? He offered me to do these deeds for money. What deeds exactly? To kill people. To kill who? He just sent me the location. Did they tell you who to kill? People. What people? Doesn't matter. Anyone you meet there, anyone you encounter, just enter the location and kill people? Yes. Once again, your full name and your year of birth. Born in 1998. September 17th. This doesn't sound like ISIS. I mean, this is not how ISIS operate. ISIS people, they usually kill themselves and they, they will not be you know, be captured. And they usually don't work for money. You know, but like the people uh, fighting for ISIS are fighting for ideology. This guy looks like a, a schmuck who is not very uh, smart, not very educated, maybe very desperate. I mean, one million rubles is about ten thousand U.S. dollars. So he he and he only received half of it. So he's he's saying for five thousand dollars he went on a killing spree. And 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 the fact that they are, uh, I, I I think the Russian authority handles this very well because they output this raw footage right away. You know, they did not wait. They they have full transparency. Like Alex, like if they had him cleaned up. Uh, clean shaven and then parade out in a court, people will say, oh, this is a kangaroo court. He probably already been coerced uh, and, and forced to confess, whatever. This is like right at the scene of his capture and and, and they have, have, have it translated. This directly contradict from the lines of the U.S. State Department because the U.S. has said, we confirm the ISIS claim we, we confirmed that, you know, the ISIS, ISIS, this was done by ISIS. And, uh, and they're like a little bit too eager to say that ISIS did this. And and from what we have seen from this confession, if this guy, what this guy said is true, this does not look like an ISIS job to me at all. Uh, your microphone, Alex, your microphone is off. 
Thank you, gentlemen, for that. Uh, lots going on behind the scenes here. Just downloading some new footage we're going to bring up here on the show in a few minutes. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, Carl, you know, your comments about, uh, you know, this doesn't seem to match uh, the narrative here. Uh, while you were uh, left the program briefly, I read a statement here, and this is the official statement. I'm just going to read it one more time for you and the program to really digest what is going on here. This is official from the U.S. Embassy government website, dated, not today, dated March the 7th. The embassy is monitoring reports that extremists, they name, named it extremists, have imminent plans to target large gatherings in Moscow to include concerts. And U.S. citizens should be advised to avoid large gatherings. Like I said, this is not a coincidence. This is uh, something really, uh, it's almost fiction. Uh, <laughs> it's so bizarre. Um, my uh, thoughts on this are the following. I was talking with Brian Berletic earlier today. And, of course, uh, with a lot of crimes, you follow the money. But this one is you follow the hardware. You follow what kind of gear they were using, what kind of guns, uh, what caliber was the guns, uh, where they got their training, how they got their training. And um, to talk about this in more detail, I know that Carl and I have had this conversation a few times where, you know, and same with the Duran, uh, Alex Christoforou has basically said, these weapons that were, you know, dumped into the Ukraine over the last two years end up being on the black market. They make their way onto the streets of Europe. And, of course, Russia, we're seeing it. My suspicion here is um, I think we have uh, quite an interesting situation here where, depending on what they come up with, what that military hardware is, you have exactly what Vladimir Putin is trying to uh, destroy, and that's people that are radicalized. And this is, you know, that first individual. I don't know. I, I would like to see what the other ones are. It seems to me like they weren't really working together. I mean, what's your thoughts on that, gentlemen? Your microphone, Carl. I may be <laughs> Uh, I, from what we know so far, from what the information that our Russian authority have released, that we know they have captured four uh, suspects who are from who have Russian passport, but they're from Tajikistan, and and these people they were shacking up with a bunch of uh, Tajik migrant workers in in Moscow. According to their confession, they didn't have jobs for, for a long time. And so they were desperate for money. And and uh, the thing you mentioned about hardware, um, Alex, so this is what I read online. This may not be accurate, but I'm sure our uh, listeners and, 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 and viewers can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, from the, the, the picture was that that was posted um, of the weapons they use. This looks like the AK-12 and the magazines. And what I have read, is, this is what been recovered by the Russian police. Uh, what I have read is that these uh, AK-12 uh, are likely, they're, they're Russian wep weapons, but they're likely being captured uh, or, or somehow, you know, the, 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 the Ukrainians got their hands on and probably uh, supplied those weapons. Or, or, or or, or some other, you know, foreign agencies supply those weapons to cover their own tracks. I mean, this is a very common tactic because during the Afghan war against Soviet Union, the, so, uh, the CIA initially, they want they don't want to make it too obvious. Um, so they source, try to source a lot of Soviet weapons for the Mujahideens. And when they couldn't acquire enough, they actually went to uh, bought a lot of Chinese made copies of the Soviet AKs and then supply them to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. So, um, you know, this is what we know about the hardware. Uh, the viewers, feel free to uh, chip in your opinions to the comments. I'm looking at the comments right now. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, we passed the thousand uh, viewers mark. So thank you, everyone, for joining uh, the program today. Uh, I just want to say before we continue on with this program, uh, Angelo Giuliano is also here. Links in the description below for everyone's channel uh, as well. 
Uh, we are broadcasting also um, on WeChat as well and Bridging News, our application. Uh, we will have links on how to get that at a later time here. I will put that into the uh, description as you're watching uh, and various other channels as well. Um, I'm going to move on to you now, Angelo. We were speaking about this uh, just prior to the program and you had uh, launched a, uh, a tweet or X or whatever we want to call it, and uh, it immediately gathered some steam. Do you want to talk about that, uh, the the tweet that you you put out on your your channel and what happened, your your feedback from that? Well, it is about the source of uh, terrorism in general because we we uh, we don't go much into the roots of terrorism. Who started terrorism around the world? Well, terrorism is a is an act of violence to achieve a political outcome. And uh, when you see around the world, the last since World War II, you had lots of terrorism uh, around the world. But very often, this, the terrorism was actually organized by by the the U.S. Uh, the collective West, I would say. But I think on the forefront is that you have the uh, the U.S., you have the MI6, you have the Mossad, and uh, that's how they how did they did they start? It was Al Qaeda. At, at first, they had Al Qaeda. They had the Mujahideen to fight against the USSR. So the USSR and, and Russia has been actually victim for a long time of those terrorist acts. And when you look at the Chechen war, the Chechen war was also an act of the CIA. Uh, more recently, I'm going to give you another example of the actually Maidan. When you look at Maidan, uh, the Ukrainian coup or, or revolution, whatever you 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 have your you, you think about it. Uh, they actually had, there was the, the mark of the CIA behind this, and they they, they also hired Central uh, Asian uh, mercenaries. They were from Georgia. And what did they do? They were actually shooting at policemen and protesters. And that's how we got to where we are in Ukraine now. So it's very, uh, it's very common that uh, they use uh, Central Asian thugs schmucks like like you said you said just before uh low life people and uh and here in this case uh, like uh, uh Karl ja just just said before it's it's not isis isis they are ideology driven and they die they die doing their mission they're not driven by money so uh and i would add one more thing is uh we see that they actually from what I, i've learned so far but again this is it's early i think there's lots of cross-examination and the information are still coming out but uh they went through turkey from what i understand and turkey actually is a platform is a platform of uh, terrorism there's lots of uh, terrorists that actually go through turkey including uh, i don't know if you remember the xinjiang terrorist etim they were all mm -hmm. actually going through Turkey. And there's, there's probably, I mean, back then, you know, there are some suspicions that actually Turkey was somehow backing those terrorists in in Xinjiang. It's a bit sensitive information. But uh, so, again, what uh, my tweet was about the fact that the U.S. doesn't need to pull the trigger. But there's probably a, what I call a tacit agreement. I'll give you an example. It's the same as... Uh, Maybe Ansar Alai, the Houthis, they might have gone to Russia and China and say, well, you know what? We are going to fight for Gaza and we are going to do this and that against those boats because we need to do something about this genocide. That's a tacit agreement. In this case, it might be the same. Passive or active involvement, but involvement, yes, because nothing would happen if there's not a final OK by the U.S., Final OK would mean just you close an eye. You know it's happening. You close an eye, and that that's my, might be the what happened. And uh, it could be it could be anything. I mean, up to now we don't we don't have all the information, but I wouldn't exclude you know rug uh, elements in Ukraine, and those rug elements. I want to point out this is extremely important. We mentioned just before we poured so much money, weapons. There are weapons everywhere. The EU and the US, they have created a problem that is going to explode in their face because the, it's, it's enormous, the quantity of weapons, the black market. And I'm looking at once Ukraine falls, you are going to have those Ukraine-Nazi elements that are going to be extremely angry. Why? Because they are going to be to realize they're being used and they are going to turn against their masters 
Remember Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda did turn against the US. It's Frankenstein. You know the story of Frankenstein? You have the monster that actually turns against its own creators. And I think the risk that we are going to see is that those people, one day they'll find out they've been fooled and they, they actually, you'll have the payback time. They'll get their taste of medicine. And that's the risk that we are we are facing in Europe in the long term because, because Ukraine is going to be a, a Kosovo on steroids. Wait. Kosovo on steroids. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> this gets very complex. I, I, I've got another note that I want to bring up to you guys. Um, if they were issuing this warning, and I'm not getting off this March 7th because uh, I'm stuck on this date here. If the Americans were issuing this warning, they must have had intelligence. And I mean, for them to immediately discredit saying, nope, Ukraine, no, we don't think it's uh, involved in any way. Uh, for them to discredit so fast, I mean, they must have uh, an idea who was behind this and uh, why did they not feel it was important to uh, well, update? Alex, Alex, you know, the, the uh, secret services in the US, they're very efficient. Remember 9-11, the same day, mm -hmm. they did found a passport, right? The same mm -hmm. day. So they might be, you know, they, they might be very efficient. But I, I think here, I, I would say we need to look at what we say. We, we, we call it qui bono. Remember qui bono. To whom benefits the crime? Remember, no stream. What did they do? No stream. The first thing they did was pointing a finger at Russia. The only country in the world that actually would not benefit from that was Russia. Here, who benefits from that? That's very simple. Very simple. You have Ukraine. You have the U.S. Uh, some well, people you are... already have uh, you already have Ukrainian officials blaming this on a black op, a, a false flag attack uh, on Russia. They claim this is the same as the uh, Balslin uh, um, apartment uh, attack in in Russia back in I think this like late 1990s. Uh, that that. This was reported in the Western media as well. You know, they, they reported that uh, uh, Putin was actually engineered this uh, terrorist attack uh, by Chechen terrorists against separatists against this uh, group of uh, Russian children that was held, held hostage to justify the second uh, Chechen war. This, I read this in New York Times. And now the, the, the Ukrainians are saying, oh, this is not their... Uh, a false flag uh, operation, but why? Why would they need another false flag operation? Putin just won election. He has a popular mandate. Um, overwhelming majority of Russians are behind him to continue the, the special operation in Ukraine. You know, the Russian public did not do not need to be mobilized even further. They're already supporting what the Russian army uh, is doing in Ukraine. So the it doesn't make sense. And what you said earlier, Angelo, about strategic attention, about, you know, Turkey's role in the Cold War, um, uh, you, you know, you, you would know about Operation Gladio, which, you know, Italy was its, uh, its center when NATO um, was doing all these uh, cloak and dag dagger operations. Now, Turkey is another axis uh, a front for the Cold War. You know, the, 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 the equivalent of Operation Gladio in Turkey is through the, this network of uh, ultra-nationalist um, group called the Grey Wolves, which is a pan-Turkic uh, uh, nationalist organization. And the Grey Wolves are deeply tied to supporting Xinjiang separatism uh, in, in China, but also to se support separatism in Russia as well, including uh, in the Caucasus, uh, in Chechnya, and also in Central Asia. So, so this th th there's that connection, and I I sent you a tweet uh, in the private chat, uh, Alex. Um, we have the uh, a tweet from DD uh, Geopolitics. Uh, this is a snapshot of uh, of uh, Jake Sullivan's email to Hillary Clinton. This is. This is was uh, mm -hmm. by WikiLeaks when WikiLeaks leaked out the uh, Hillary Clinton's email. So Jake Sullivan, who is now the national security advisor of Biden, he was actually 
Clinton's man. He was a Hillary's man. He was supposed to take power back in uh, in, a, in a Hillary Clinton presidency. But, you know, we know Clinton Clinton presidency didn't happen. Uh, but so he was always very tight with Hillary Clinton. So he sent an email to Hillary back in 2011, you know, back when the, the uh, during the, the Arab spring, uh, springtime when um, when Obama and Hillary were funding jihadis all across the Middle East. And what he what he said in this email, uh, he said, um, see the last item, Al Qaeda is on our side in Syria. Otherwise, things have been basically turned out as expected. And this this email was dated from February 12, 2012, at the beginning of the Syrian war, right? And now the same Jake Sullivan got a second chance to serve in the zombie Biden's presidency. You know, we, we know we know Zol we know Biden is not really making foreign policy decisions. This guy can barely form a coherent sentence, right? So Jake Sullivan is the guy who is responsible for architecting much of the U.S. foreign policy, including the proxy war in Ukraine, including supporting Israel and including containment of China. So, so this was what Jake Solomon said back 10 years ago to Hillary. Al Qaeda is on our side. I mean, now he is in power again. You know, I, it's 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 not a great leap. A, a, a face to believe that Jake Sullivan is up to his same tricks again. And and then there, I have another uh, a, a tweet I sent to the chat, Alex. Um, this is a tweet. I, this is just a screen capture I took from the CBS News uh, a, a website on this uh, development in Russia. And in the CBS News, it says, U.S. warned Russia about planned terrorist attack in Moscow. National Security Council says, remember, Jake Sullivan is a head of the National Security Council. He's a national security advisor. And this this uh, CBS News says the United States share information about a potential terrorist attack in Moscow with Russian Rus Russia's government earlier this month. Spokesperson for the National Security Council said the U.S. embassy in Russia on March 7th warned U.S. citizens to avoid crowds and say it was monitoring reports that extremist attack might attack large gathering in Moscow. Earlier this month, the U.S. government had information about a planned terrorist attack in Moscow, potentially targeting large gathering to include concerts, which prompted the State Department to issue a public advisory to Americans in Russia. The National Security Council spokesperson, Adrian Watson, said the U.S. government also shared this information with Russian authority in accordance with its longstanding duty to warn policy, Watson said. Well, um, so why don't it be more forthright to come uh, to 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 go to the public with more details about what they know. I mean, the common excuse they use is like, oh, we don't want to disclose our sources. We don't want to... Now, you don't have to. You can still, you can provide enough details about who is carrying out these attacks without, you know, going to details of how you discover it, right? Right. I mean, instead, we have John Kirby saying, oh, it's too early to tell whether it's both politically motivated. And then... Uh, and then after ISIS claimed responsibility, now they're dead set on saying, oh, it's ISIS. U.S. Uh, intelligence has confirmed ISIS claim is, is certified as true. I mean, this is just a little bit too convenient. Um, and, and just like Angelo, you said, Shui Bono, how does Russia benefit this? This is, this is a, but how, how would United States benefit from this? Because the United States right now is actually... Uh, 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 facing a, 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 a geopolitical quandary because they're facing a three-front war. They're, being, they're bogged down in Ukraine, which there's no prospect for victory for the Ukrainian side. They are deeply involved in supporting Israel committing atrocity in Gaza, which is you know losing whatever soft power U.S. had across the world. And at the same time, U.S. Navy demonstrated its complete impotence in the face of the the answer our uh blockade of the the, the the shippings you know you have u.s admiral 
telling the telling U.S. media, say this is the largest battle U.S. Navy have fought since World War II. Well, guess what, buddy? And you are losing. You are losing to the Houthis. The, 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 the Yemenis are now a, a legitimate, legitimate world naval power. They're redirecting 11% of the world's, world's shipping traffic. And, and guess what? They're not blocking ship from China and Russia. China actually getting a large discount on the, on the, on the shipping insurance through the Red Sea because the, the, the Houthis, they know not to attack the Chinese. And that's why you have all the ships on the cow sign. They're saying, oh, we're China owned or we have a Chinese crew aboard. We're going to a Chinese destination. Please don't attack us. Even with that, um, that British ship, that British ship that falsely claimed that it was China owned, but 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 I guess Yemen, Yemenis had better intelligence and, and they hit it anyway. So so right now, U.S. desperately is looking for a win to at least to distract from its own impotence. You know, this is why you are seeing an uptick in the so-called Xinjiang atrocity story. You know, Xinjiang atrocity mm-hmm. porn is being again. In on Twitter, this is to distract from what's happening in Israel, what's happening in Palestine, and 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 this is another uh, the terrorist attack on Russia would serve another distraction to shift the attention of the world from the spotlight on the the, the U.S. Mm-hmm. empire is actually scrambling and declining, and 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 then they 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 want to shift that focus. To Russia and put on the owners on the Russian government to 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 you know have Putin to to show that okay now Putin have to answer for why they didn't provide security for his people but I, this is got not going to backfire because obviously what it's going to do is going to it's it's going to pull the Russian people together because this is what people do in in times of attack terrorist attacks in times of uh, invasion, adversity, people will come together and there will be more solidarity. Uh, people will rally behind the flag. People will rally behind Putin. And and and, and uh, this is, it, it, right now, U.S. is not com- is not convincing anybody right now. No, I, and I, I agree with you. I mean, they use the triple B strategy, uh, you know, or triple four. Uh, they're adding to it by the week, you know, bomb, ban, or bankrupt, or bully. And uh, that seems to be the playbook. Now that we're on talking about the the shipping routes, um, I heard an interesting comment, uh, and a gentleman was asking me last week about the Americans' uh, acquisition uh, accusations uh, against China for dumping goods internationally. I can tell you from my experience here that, listen, if you don't make tires, if you don't make clothes, if you don't manufacture anything in your country, You are reliable on China, and I call it the Lego economy. And what's interesting here is it's if you focus on the United States, on the east coast of the United States, let's focus in on the automobiles. And this is really starting to uh, come into the headlines where they're saying, oh, you know, these e-vehicles are so expensive. Well, clearly they haven't seen the $10,000 BYD model uh, that every uh, every single delivery driver would buy in the United States. On top of that, every Uber driver would buy it in the United States uh, to keep that cost down. Um, but they can't even get these uh, charging stations across the country. That's the first one. The second one is, is United States does not really you know, manufacture cars anymore. They are, I'm going to call it a Lego facility. They are a manu, not a manufacturing, but more of a assembly plant. If you read it in the, uh, in the newspapers in Canada, they'll say, oh, General Motors at their assembly plant. That's right. They get the tires in the boxes, the rims that come on another shipment. They're, you know, grabbing the sofa uh, for the motor home from another uh, part of China and whatever. They just put it together. It's like Lego. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the United States, and I'm going to either pass this to Angelo or Carl, the U.S. Acqu- accusations against China for dumping goods internationally. How can they avoid... <laughs> When the people on the other side are saying, we need this stuff. If we don't get this stuff, we can't make cars. We can't put shoes on our kids' feet. I mean, it's, it's, uh, Carl, unmute your microphone there. I mean, 
And, they're, and blaming, people, people, they're, they're blaming the very person that is keeping their country going. It's crazy. And, and people keep on saying, oh, China, because they have, uh, you know, they have lax labor practices, they have slave labor, whatever. But if you act, people actually look at videos of, of, uh, of uh, inside a U.S. car factory versus you uh, inside a Chinese car factory. The, all the new Chinese car factories are highly automated. You have robots doing everything. And then you have, if you, you switch to the, the, the image inside the U.S. car factory, they still have people, you know, bolting on the doors and stuff. I mean, of course, China will be able to make cheaper cars. Uh, and, and this is, but people don't even realize how far behind the U.S. manufacturer have, have fallen and this is well, thing. answer you know, me this just... okay. answer so me I, this i used to say okay, tell me tell me that tell thought, me. Hold that, hold that thought. <laughs> let me let me finish this once uh, one thought you got it you got it i used to i used to say that you know us making nothing but uh weapons and only fans domestically but right now i just realized even that's not true a uh, us navy just went went to south korea and japan asking for help to help upgrade U.S. naval ability, build up capabilities, because U.S. lacks, uh, you know, China has two hundred times the the navy, the naval build up capability than United States. Yes, you heard that right, two hundred times. So this U.S. is going to Japan and South Korea to ask for help. How can they, you know, how can we ramp up our our, our naval production? This is a joke. Okay, sorry. Go back back to you, Alex. Uh, uh, I just want to add this one here. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, you got it right. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, so anyway, guys, I, I really want to focus in on this. Then we'll get back to the Russia stuff in a moment here. But this all is connected because it's either uh, economic warfare or it's terrorism or whatever it is to try to destabilize these countries. Now, if you look at the manufacturing, I'm really concerned about the new energy vehicles here. They are very successful here in China. Of course, you're going to have competition here. Competition is going to weed out the weak people. But as they move forward, I'm in a city of 32 million Chongqing. Every day, you can see more of these cars coming onto the streets. And you ask these Americans, North Americans, just like my mother, I, I spoke with her and I said, Mom, new energy vehicles. And she says, you know, they can't take away that American muscle. I said, well, it's not about taking away the American muscle, the American car from you. It's about, you know, trying to, uh, th this can actually change your life. And when you explain it to a person, an elderly person like her, and say, listen, get behind a, a, a car, sit in a Neo, sit in a Zeke, or sit in a uh, B BYD. You lose your vision when you get around 80, but if you can see a car on a monitor that you couldn't see with your even your spectacles on and you're about to slam into it, well, there's AI technology saving your life for you. Second of all, is they really they're really hell bent on you know this power. We need gas power because these cars are weak. They're not weak. You know, when I first when I first uh, sat in a new energy vehicle here in uh, China, I got out of the car. And I said, wait a minute, there's no way this thing is battery powered. It can't be. And I got out and I was looking at the back. I said, Where, where's the exhaust pipe? Somebody's, you know, is, am I on candid camera? Is somebody making a video about me? I mean, is, are they having a laugh at me? And I got out and I was in that car and I said, you know, this is unbelievable. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, I think it's culture. Alex, I, I just want to jump on this because this is, we don't touch this enough, and I think uh, I think we can we can give some input when it comes to why why do ha do we have those different strategy when it comes to economy, society, absolutely everything. And it's it's just I would say it, it comes down to cultural. You see, China is it has a pragmatic scientific approach. The West is ideal ideology driven. So in China, it, it's it's about tangible stuff. It's not about ideology. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's let's. Let's switch back. Are you okay if we switch back to the uh, some of the Russian stuff now, guys? You okay with that? Yes, sure. Uh, or Carl, just one, minute. one minute. Let me let me have the last word on this. And, and, and then, Angelo, if you got uh, something I, to add, go for it. And then we'll get back I, to the stuff. I, 
because I want to play the devil's advocate here, right? So it's not mm -hmm. like we're, we're just all one-sided. So I, I think that the people in North America, particularly, who are skeptical about EVs, they do have a point. Why? <laughs> because the United States lacks the infrastructure, the lacks of power generation to support the transition to EVs. You know, you have Texas that people will freeze their ass off in a storm. You think that U.S. electric grid can support a lot of new vehicles on the road? No, of you course can. not. And, and, and you, you know, U.S. The power grid does not have ex excess power generation capability. And those privatized companies are look, not looking to add anymore. They just want to squeeze out the juice out of the existing grid to charge more. And, and that, that's not how China works. You know, China keep on adding uh, 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 capacity because they they know, you know, you build it, it will come. They will always find, uh, uh, you know, use for this additional energy. And, and, and you, China is building out all these amazing uh, charging stations and infrastructure for the EV transition. U.S. doesn't have that. U.S. doesn't have a, a coordinated government policy. They're all responding to like, oh, what China is doing. But they, it's all very ad hoc. Uh, like piecemeal Mickey Mouse stuff. It's it's not gonna work. It's I'm sorry. It's not gonna work in you you as until we have actual responsible, capable government. <laughs> okay, guys. So we got some uh, just some updates here. And guys, thank you for that segment. Um, I know bringing it up, I wasn't going to get out of this quickly with a two-minute answer. So uh, I expected that. And we'll have another show on that later for sure as we get more into China topics. I'm going to read something here that just came across the newswire here. It says, Russian President Vladimir Putin has addressed the nation in the aftermath of the attack uh, of the city hall here, the Crocus City Hall, saying that additional anti-terrorist measures have since been implemented in Moscow and Moscow regions. I can imagine that will be uh, some sort of, I don't want to use the word lockdown, but we'll just call it extra security measures. The main goal now is to prevent those, now this, listen carefully on this one, guys, because I was not aware of this, but uh, here we go. The main goal now is to prevent those who are behind this bloodbath from committing new crimes. So it seems like uh, this saga has definitely not ended. Now, 11 people have been detained over the shooting in uh, Krasnogorsk, including four direct perpetrators of the attack, he said. The four suspects were trying to flee Russia. Mark it. And I got to tell you, um, this came right from Angelo. You predicted this right on the money. The four suspects were trying to flee Russia for Ukraine with arrangements being made for them across the border, he added. According to the president, investigators are now working to identify the accomplices of the terror of the terrorism or the terrorists who uh, stashed weapons for them, provided with uh, vehicles and perpetrated escape routes into the Ukraine. Well, 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 well. Um, Let's unpack that, gentlemen. Angelo, I'm throwing this one over to you. Well, I think uh, now they are going to hit much harder. I wouldn't be surprised that they start uh, hitting the leadership. Uh, I mean, in Kiev. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Zelensky is at risk now. He might not be enjoying the millions uh, of uh, the money he's got from uh, the military industrial complex. You know, he's a highly corrupt person. And he might not enjoy the villas he's got in Miami and London. Uh, I think there's a risk. There's a risk of escalation. Is uh, Putin is, is going to do something. Uh, it's going to be tough. Uh, but on the other side, keep in mind that we are facing, uh, when you look at the front, the front is about to collapse. And this is why you have Macron gesticulating. Uh, I'm sending 20,000 troops. Well, guess what? Macron needs 20,000 troops just for the Olympics. He doesn't have those troops and he doesn't have ammunition. He's just, you know, he's just like, uh, he's only good in making uh, Photoshop uh, pictures when he's, he's, he looks like beefed up like, like uh, Zelensky. He's just, just clowns. Uh, so in reality, what is happening right now is, you know, it's going according to plan. Uh, but Putin needs to make a point here. And I think there's a risk that... Uh, he might, he might at some point decapitate, not necessarily Zelensky, but the, 
the the leadership in in uh, in Kiev. I wouldn't be surprised that it would hit directly Kiev uh, and the leadership. Um, but then it's, it's speculation, but something will happen. And I think, keep in mind, people for, tend to forget this is not a war. We are still into a special military operation, but now we are on the fringe of going into something much more serious. Uh, and I, from the last news we got from uh, Brian Belletic and all the, the, the Duran, it seems like there's no more like air defense. They, they don't have enough, enough uh, anti-air defense missiles. So basically now you have you have a Russia that actually can bomb some, do some serious bombing inside Ukraine. And the front is collapsing. Uh, so what happens is that they, are, they need to prepare to withdraw troops, you know, they had they they will have to withdraw troops, and this is going to be the, the biggest humiliation ever for for NATO. NATO is over; everything is over. It's just a matter of time. So right now, time is on the side of Russia. Time is on the side of the multipolar world, and we are living this time, this very special time of transition. Now the question is, are they going to accept that? And I think. I think they are mad dogs. You know, it's a wounded dog. The most dangerous you can have is a wounded dog. And this is the last gasp. It's a hit. And I think they are going to be extremely irrational before maybe they, they get back to their senses and they become adults. Because what we need right now is adults on the table. You cannot win that war. You've lost. The, the world is changing. Just face it. There's a transition. You are not, the collective West is not the world. Rule-based order, you know, it's not, you know, people do not believe in that. Time is changed. You need to face it. Just become adults. What we have is globalist elites, which have hijacked Western societies because, because again, it's not the Western people. Western societies are hijacked by mad people. They want to hold on to power. They do not accept this transition. They need to accept it. And the tipping point the the inflection moment is Ukraine. Ukraine was all along the inflection moment, transition from U.S. hegemony to multipolar world. Face it, become adult, sit down on the table, and negotiate something. You need to prepare the world of tomorrow. I want to add to that, Angelo, and I think I've got a good argument here. Um, if you look back, uh, let's go back all the way to, uh, I guess it would be March of 1999, uh, the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. Now that lasted 78 days of complete aerial bombardment, okay? And my father at the time uh, said to me a couple of weeks before that happened, he says, Clinton is in trouble. Um, the whole administration is not going to protect him. We all know the Monica Lewinsky story uh, where uh, he he got caught lying about the whole situation and he was about to be impeached. And out of nowhere, Madeleine Albright, the whole gang, the drums started beating. And I said, Dad, you, why does America care about Yugoslavia? And why does America care about Muslims in this area? It's the first time in his history I've ever heard about it. OK, and he says, this is the playbook. Watch. And this was the first time that NATO had ever gone in. And when they went in, guys, you know, and I visited all these regions that uh, were the former Yugoslavia, where there was Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Slovakia, uh, Serbia. When I rolled into Serbia, that place uh, years after that war, America didn't go back in there to rebuild it. They did nothing, absolutely nothing to that place. And they Use this rule book. And that's why I'm saying, Angelo, these guys that are running NATO now are the same old dogs that were doing it back 20 some years ago. And they have this confidence. They said, you know what? We can rip this place apart. We ripped Yugoslavia apart in 78 days. We bombed it. We got away with it. We dropped massive amount of artillery. We killed people. And we left scattered bombs all over the place. We walked away. Ha ha. They did nothing about it. And that's where I think NATO still thinks that if we put all this hardware, we keep going while well, they've passed the 78 days in Ukraine. That's for sure. 
And if we pump a quarter of a trillion dollars, just maybe, maybe we can get the good old days of Yugoslavia back and really teach, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin a lesson. And I think that's the problem here. I think they are so arrogant that they think that they can, you know, continue to move in their hardware. It's not working. They move it in. It gets blown up. Technology has changed here. We're in 2024. I was talking to Patrick Lancaster the other day. Patrick said, it's drone warfare. It's absolute drone warfare. And you see these guys wearing these FPV drone uh, things, uh, flying them, dropping them, direct hit. Amazing video that uh, just went out on his channel. 250,000 views, I think, in the first 24 hours. I mean, of a, of a channel that suppresses it. But that's my whole point. 78 days of NATO bombing in Yugoslavia. They blew the place up. They walked away. They laughed at it. They crippled that country. And no wonder the Serbian guy here was one of the first guys to come out and say, you know what? And I made notes earlier today uh, about this. Um, he said um, pretty much after John Kirby was talking, he says, John Kirby, you're full of shit. You, you are totally uh, full of shit. You're lying. And Maria Zakharova also came in there and uh, pretty much uh, stood behind him. If the audience doesn't understand why Serbia takes such a different approach to this, go back. Go back and understand what really happened there. Um, it was catastrophic. And I cannot tell you, that was the last time, I think, guys, that we actually had true journalists embedded either on the front line or covering a war because most of these guys now that are telling us what's going on in Ukraine, well, they're coming from, I don't know, Warsaw. They're reporting from Warsaw, from the Sheraton Warsaw or the Ritz Carlton in Frankfurt uh, telling what thousands of miles away is. So I really think that uh, this whole thing with Russia, they're trying the tactics because remember, there was a lot of issues going on with terrorist attacks, bombings, uh, Islamic fundamentalists in this NATO uh, 78 days and bombing in Yugoslavia. And they used religion, too. They brought religion into this. So this could be the second part of it. That's just my thoughts. Anybody want to add to it? Yeah. Remember the NATO spring commander back then who directed this uh, campaign against Yugoslavia? I'm talking about Wesley Clark. He actually yes. came out and said after 9-11 uh, that U.S. had a plan to take out seven countries in five years. And those are Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. I mean, it, it, U.S. Is always try to get Iran, but other than Iran, U.S. pretty much carry out uh, its regime change operation against six uh the six other countries, you know, the, 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 the Iran is an odd one out because, you know, they couldn't they couldn't do anything to Iran. Um, not that they didn't try. But but this is has always been the plan. And, and you mentioned about Yugoslavia. So I'm a little bit younger than you, Alex. Um, I was mm -hmm. uh, I was in high school back then and I was a paper boy for New York Times. So I would read New York Times every day. And back then I bought the whole narrative, a NATO narrative on Yugoslavia, well, first during the Bosnian War. But by the time of Kosovo War came, came along, I was like, oh, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. This, this is not, something is not right here. And then they, that's when they bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. Yeah. You know, the Euro. That's the only single instance of bombing that was, the target was selected by the CIA and the the plane, the NATO plane they chose to carry out the attacks, they didn't fly from the bases in Germany. They flew from Whitman Air Base in United States, flew directly to bomb uh, the Chinese embassy uh, in Belgrade, a target that selected only target that was selected by CIA during the entire war. And then they say, oh, it's a big accident because of map air. I mean, nobody in China bought that. Um, and uh, China at that time had to kind of swallow its pride because in 1998, you know, China really was a much in a much weaker position vis-a-vis -vis United States. Um, you know, like like they, they wouldn't be able to.
do do something like that right now. And and but I, I think you are right. There's a mode of operandum here. You know, they they have uh, perfected throughout the years, starting with with. Uh, by the way, Kosovo is still under NATO occupation, and it's a shithole. It's it's a, it's a place I've been full there. Of, I've been there it's too. place full of drugs, crimes, and corruption, and most of the. Uh, a, a man either have to immigrate elsewhere, look for jobs, and or they just join criminal gangs. I mean, it's not it's not a happy place. It's been occupied by NATO since the end of Kosovo War, which was like end of 1990s. I mean, it's been yeah, but Carl, there's no motivation to make Kosovo better. It's a great washing machine. It's a fantastic washing machine. Chaos equals cash. That's the last thing they they want. They don't want to bring peace and prosperity to Kosovo. Hell no. No, it's a great washing machine. But let's follow the dots here because after uh, the NATO invasion, then you started seeing things happening in the Ukraine. And I think at that time, you know, you started to see, you know, the Maidan, then you had the Orange Revolution. You had all these things dating all the way back into the early 2000s. And I just remember watching uh, in the center of Kiev, Thousands of people, not for a day, not for a week, but months going there, protesting, enjoying nice cooked meals, um, holding up probably very expensive placards, probably anywhere from three to five hundred dollars. They were really well printed out and trying to overthrow the government. I mean, these are very planned um, attempts to overthrow governments. They were successful. Um, the NATO uh, destruction of Yugoslavia was successful. Now they are trying to claw back what they can against Russia. And unfortunately, there's a guy in there that's saying, bring it on. <laughs> Let's go. Um, I've got six more years. Uh, I can walk up uh, a flight of stairs to get on an airplane. My brain is still intact. Um, Joe, are you there? Uh, who knows? So my feelings about this is, is this uh, attack that happened? And guys, these are big numbers. Shooting 100 people, like killing 100 people and wounding another 150 to 200. And I guess the count is going higher. This was well orchestrated, well trained. Uh, I don't just think that guy that had a boot on his head uh, did it for five grand was told a few weeks ago. There's no way that uh, something like that. Um, and maybe this uh, March 7th warning was uh, kind of like, hey, guys, we already paid you. Hurry up. You're late for the dance. This, I don't know. I Carl, think that's it. I, I think what the March 7th warning is, it offer U.S. a chance of plausible deniability. They can now say, oh, see, I, I warned you. I did my part. I warned you, see, that you didn't do anything was your fault, right? But uh, but Ru I don't think Russians are buying it. I mean, from what I read right now, many people believe the U.S. is ultimately behind uh, the planning. In fact, there was um, uh, uh, the, the head of uh, uh, um, of the Den uh, of the head of Donetsk People's Republic, uh, Pushling, he, he actually said, we know who is behind this. We, we, know, we know who the customer and financiers are. We know the cynicism of the Ukrainian regime and those who control it. And he, this is his comment on the terror attack. And he added that terrorism has no nationality, but there are criminal regimes and the source of terror must be eradicated with iron determination. And you know what? I think at this point, the best scenario for the people of Ukraine is actually a, a, a war that's settled in Russia's favor. I, I say this. Um, because I actually recently watched a documentary by a Japanese documentary filmmaker who is famous in China. He interviewed a, a couple, uh, a, a Ukrainian woman who married a, a, a Chinese guy who experienced a war from February uh, 2000, 2022. They were living in Kharkiv. And so they, they were in their apartment when their buildings were bombed. So they escaped with the help of Chinese embassy and they first escaped to 
uh, Western Ukraine and from there because she was married to a Chinese national. So they flew to China with the uh, with the mother-in-law and but the mother-in-law decide to because you know china is a completely alien place and she actually decided to go to russia she went to moscow to work there and so this, this japanese filmmaker was very surprised it's like you're ukrainian you experience a war why did you go to russia and she said I grew up in Soviet Union, you know, Russia and Ukraine is the same, is the same to me. And, and for me, my, my reason to go to Moscow is because I want to be able to access to my daughter who lives in China, you know, from, from Russia, I can go to China anytime I want. That's not possible if I go to Ukraine. There's nothing left for me in Ukraine anymore because the only, only, uh, only blood I have is my daughter. So that that's when I realized, you know, like a lot of people don't realize, uh, they, they know a lot of Ukrainian refugees who fled to Europe, uh, but they don't know there's equally a large number of Ukrainian that chose to migrate to Russia and make their life in Russia. And, and when everything settles, you know, people can look at the footage of Mariupol. Russia already rebuilt Mariupol into a nice clean place. Um, Ukraine is not going to, like you said, Kosovo has been occupied by NATO for 20 years. It's still a shithole. NATO <laughs> lacks either the resources nor the will to rebuild Ukraine. You know, Russia could do that. And especially, you know, if they also rope in China to, to do Belt and Road, road Project. So I, that's something that United States will never uh, offer, and it's never offer. It's never even on the table. All the U.S. can offer is more weapons. You know what they're doing to Taiwan and Philippines right now. They can't offer a real economic development. They never could. You, Carl, before I let Andrew jump in there, we keep saying, you know, your comment. You're saying, you know. Will they will NATO rebuild or help uh, protect Ukraine while they rebuild? They don't want that. They never want that. That's the last thing NATO wants. Uh, you know, I'm trying to connect the dots here for everybody on this screen that this is what NATO does. Uh, NATO's playbook, and we have it right in front of us. And that's why I brought up, you know, the Yugoslavia example. Checks and balances out the window. What happened to that artillery that was brought into that region? It went in and it ended up on the streets of Europe. Terrorist attacks happened uh, shortly after that. The playbook gets uh, rebooted again and again and again and again. We're seeing countries that uh, suffered economic hardship. Haiti is going through another uh, situation again, even though uh, you know the Americans went in there and tried to rebuild it. Billions of dollars were raised. And that's what I'm saying, that NATO, that's not their intention to go in there. It's to funnel billions of dollars of artillery. You have any time that you have a business plan that you can convince a country that they got to give up 2% of their GDP every two years. Wow, you got a great business plan and you got one hell of a washing machine. NATO, they love destruction. Killing, they make a killing on the killing. And I have never, ever, ever trusted those guys. Um, you know, as Canadians, we used to put, uh, uh, always put a, a Canadian flag on our backpack uh, to represent, not that we were proud to be Canadian, but actually to represent that we weren't Americans. And I used to have that thought go through my mind. And it's true. Anybody that's watching watching the show, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about if they're Canadians. If they're Americans, they will probably have either ordered a you know maple leaf and put it on their backpack from eBay. But anyway, let's get through to this. I know, guys, I'm going somewhere with this. No, no, uh, no, no. no. <laughs> Let me jump in no, about this flag. I mean, you you guys, Canadians used to be cool. What happened to Canadians? Well, let I me mean, tell no. you. Now with okay. Trudeau, I mean Trudeau is, I mean you know he makes he makes almost Macron look cool. I mean you know how how low is that? I mean really. Well, let what me add. I, 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 you I, haven't heard the rest of this part because this is where it gets beautiful, and this is why it, it, it's coming, Angelo. So the dots are being connected here. So on my vacation, 
when I went to discover and people ask me, you know, why don't you go to somewhere nice? Why are you going to Belgrade <laughs> two years after the NATO bombed the hell out of the country? Why not? I want to learn history. I want to understand it. I arrived in Belgrade. I went out for dinner and I had a Irish friend with me. And after dinner, uh, I think most of you guys know this in the eastern parts of Europe. Uh, it's very, very uh, normal to get bottle service. You go out for drinks and stuff like that. And I went up to a club there and I said, yeah, I'd like a table for two outside, a bottle there, no problem. And the girl says, um, no, I'm not going to let you in. And I said, why? She said, you American? I said, no, I'm a proud Canadian. And she said, even worse. And I said, okay, why? And she said, I'll make you a deal. You walk three blocks straight ahead, turn to your left. You see that bright light there? Go have a look at that. When you see that bright light there, I'll let you in. I'll give you any table you want. I walk three blocks, probably 150 meters at about 7.30 in the evening, bright lights, turn to my left, massive Canadian flag hanging from a bombed out building with a question mark, black on it. I went back to the hotel. The bartender and anybody that watching this program, you know, Serbian guys are built like a brick. Anyway, I don't have to say it, but these guys are tough guys. They've been through a lot. And the guy said to me, hey, looks like you've seen a ghost. I said, well, yeah, I saw my Canadian flag hanging from a bombed out building. And he says, did you know that you guys have fast jets? And I was an anti, uh, anti-aircraft uh, gunner. He says, 70% of your Canadian jets flew the sorties, which destroyed Yugoslavia. And that's the last day that I ever traveled with a Canadian flag on anything that I own. And that tells you, you know, we used to be cool, but we used to be led into a lot of uh, big mistakes. And we're seeing one right now here where uh, we're walking into another NATO, uh, I would say Yugoslavia part two, but yet it's the other way around this time. Gentlemen. Well, I mean, there were, there were times when Canada could have some wiggle room to like <laughs> not completely piggyback on the U S foreign adventures. But now, now when you Washington says jump, Trudeau says how high, you know, I mean, right now it's really not much difference. They're just appendage of the U S empire. I mean, Carl, you know, the is this a statement, what happened on the weekend here? We are seeing a lot of people that have been, uh, you know, killed here. This is big, big numbers. Um, is this a statement? I mean, this isn't a couple people shot, uh, you know, uh, rogue, uh, you know, lone wolf in a shopping mall. Uh, you know, last count we had here, and viewers, you can update us, and I'll put it on here, but the last count we had was 133 and growing. And when they say, you know, 150 uh, in critical condition, you could bet that at least 50% of those aren't going to make it. This is big. These are big, big numbers. So this is a statement. Yeah, I think they chose the place to inflict the maximum amount of casualties possible. It's it's meant to shock. It's meant to shock and create uh, atmosphere, fear, atmosphere of fear. You know, I remember in China, this happened in uh, 2014 during the Kunming train station attack when a, a group of terrorists, a knife-wielding terrorists, went to the Kunming tra train station and just stabbing anybody they saw. And at that time, that was, you know, that created a lot of uh, fear and consternation, uh, anger. Um, so I can I can sympathize. I can I can uh, see how, you know, sympathize with with Moscow bites right now um, there must be going through similar emotions but it, this is what terrorism is designed to do is designed to create fear but at the end of the day I think you know you cannot cower the Russian people I mean the, the, these people this people withstood to Hitler they're not gonna they're not gonna bend just because a, a, a one one terror attack this is gonna just sh sharpen the Russian resolve to deal with Ukraine issue. This is because this is a most urgent, foremost urgent issue right now for, for, for Russia. So I I, I, I don't think all the subterfuge about ISIS, all that bull crap, um, I don't think you know Putin buys any of that shit.
Um, it's going to be, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, I think, you know, Angela nailed it earlier. There's going to be some major pushback here. Um, I mean, look what Netanyahu did after his incident happened. Uh, he's obliterated uh, Gaza completely. I wouldn't be surprised if Russia is the one that actually uh, escalates the situation here and says, you know what? Okay, enough is enough. Uh, when they get the confirmed story here, I think we're going to see cities uh, along uh, the coast that play a significant role there, which uh, they've talked about before. We're talking Odessa. Uh, we're talking uh, maybe the connection to Transnistria as well, which will pretty much sew up any access to uh, the waterways and officially at that point will make Ukraine landlocked. I cannot see um, restraint here. Not with these numbers. If it was, you know, a small and even one life is too much. But even if it was a small amount, you could understand. But this guy's under some serious pressure here. And, uh, you know, 100 and some people dead uh, right smack in the middle of the city. I don't know. Angelo, you think I, he's going to? I I don't know. I mean, we might have some younger audience here, but I'm old enough to remember there was a similar attack also in a concert hall in Moscow during the che late phase of the Chechen war. Um, mm -hmm. And that did not stop Russian uh, uh, pacifying Chechnya. Remember, Chechnya during the Chechen war, Washington fully supported the Chechen separatists. You know, New York Times were publishing glowing accounts of all these Chechen rebel leaders, making them to, out to be some kind of heroes. And, and during that time, the, the people, Chechnya was... A, 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 a terrible place. There was slavery. There was like slaves who were being openly traded. Uh, there was no safety. And and you look at the Chechnya now. Chechnya is now is a nice clean place. And this is why I say the best hope for the people of Ukraine right now is complete and total Russian victory. And th then there's a, there will be a chance for actual rebuild. You know, like what happened in Mariupol, um, and the, the, you know, like what happened in Chechnya. Uh, you know, che this che like Chechnya and and now and, and and before are night and day difference. Whereas NATO occupied place like Kosovo is still a freaking uh, festering wound in Europe, and and you know that's if if Ukraine is is to be allowed to continue to exist as a battleground as a proxy for proxy war against Russia, the people is just going to prolong people's suffering in Ukraine. The best chance for peace uh, and stability right now looks like complete and, and total Russian victory. Yeah, it is, it is quite shocking. I, I don't know if you, if you I mean, if we, sometimes I, I try to, to think, uh, to look at uh, what happened in, the, in those last few years. I mean, especially since Ukraine, uh, how brutal the world is is becoming really uh, not that it's becoming actually it, it hasn't changed you see i mean uh, especially we saw the holocaust i mean we we tend to think well that, that was the past that was the past but in reality uh, look look at what those elites are doing because again you know we are talking about elites that want to hold on to power uh in ukraine we are talking about probably a half a million people that died that died for a globalist agenda they want to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. It's very clear. They, they do not care for one second about Ukrainians. Then we see we see Palesti Palestinians. I mean, the slaughter, the slaughter. It's a massacre. Civilians, unarmed civilians, thousands of babies being killed. Now we see they're hurrying, you know, I mean, the U.S. is on the, is on, on the background. They, they're doing this in Russia, killing civilians like this. How brutal is that? And you see, I have the impression that if they really could, they would, you know, if they, if they could, they would drop nuclear bombs. They, they are as mad as that because they want to hold on to power. So the only thing that is restraining them is that they are facing other countries that have nuclear power bombs. But otherwise, I, I mean, remember, not, remember, uh, uh, Carl, the U.S. wanted to drop nuclear power bombs 
into China, right? They would have well, done. They were it. planning to. They were planning they to planning. in 1958. They were planning yeah, to and, use nukes against China. And they have preemptive strike policy. That means this is a possibility. It is a possibility. The, you see, the the advantage that Russia has is they have a very high level of uh, uh, air defense. And uh, that means that they would be able to react. And this is why actually people, they tend to forget that why Russia doesn't want NATO to expand eastward. It's very simple because it's the time of reaction. Time of reaction. You are struck by a nuclear power bomb. You need enough time to react. The closer you get to Russia, the higher is the risk because they will not be able to identify who's come, what is coming. So that move puts puts us in, in a much more difficult position. So what I'm seeing is that I'm very worried because it is pure madness, completely pure madness. And you see this Western hegemony has been built on containment, destruction, chaos. All along, those revolutions, they call for human rights, freedom, and so on. What did it bring to Ukraine? It was a tool. It's just like you know, empty words. We are going to bring you uh, demo democracy. It, you know, it, it's it's never been so so worse than that. I mean, you know, it, you know, there's no more like autocratic regime than Zelensky. You know, his ban opposition, his ban uh, uh, medias. He, he's a, I mean, he's a dictator, uh, and, and he's not. And, and the the most important is not working for his own country. I mean, that's the foundation. You see, the U.S. I, I like, we need to point out this, this is so important because everybody talks about democracy, but they have no clue. The precondition for democracy is sovereignty. It is about self-determination of people, meaning that I am going to be able to decide for my own fate, right? You want to export that, but it's going to be decided in Washington. You are not, it's the most anti-democratic, movement what they want to do it's going to be my democracy on my own terms it is not sovereignty if we want to build a better world is going to be the ground up sovereignty first people need to decide for their own faith but this is going against this globalist agenda we need to point out that what they want to do is a globalist agenda which is going to be ruled by globalist elites multinational cooperation and ultimately destruction of nation state and it's going to be a world of the one percent against the 99 percent i why why am i saying this because we need to remind people there's there's a geopolitics it's country to countries but there's a highest game higher game is globally elites and they want to hold on to power they do not care about country so if you care about your country you need to go against this agenda they don't care about country, they don't care about individual, they don't care about family. It's a project of deconstruction. It's evil, it's satanist. It is, it is somehow. And they are willing to be, to, to go to the rock bottom. They do not care about civilians. And when I look at, you see, when I look at what is happening in Gaza, it's a social experiment. I do believe that. The way they are acting, they're willing to do that to civilian Palestinians, but they, you know what? They do that to them today. They'll do that to you tomorrow. Today, they will do that to their own population because it's a police state, prison state. The US, for example, 4% of the world population, 25% of the incarcerated population. The risk, because you know, see people, they, they take the side of the their country. Italy, or, you know, you're in the, the collective West and somehow you feel okay, you know, because because you have you, your hands on the narrative, right? Uh, ultimately, people need to be careful because they are the first victims. If you're American, you are yourself a victim of your own system. It's not about us and them. We are the 99% of the people victim of the 1% globalist elites. They want to destroy this world. And what I, we have, I think, I think most Americans today already waking up to the fact that their politicians are shit and they don't give a crap about them. Um, and and the, the the real problem is how do they get how do they get these fuckers out? And uh, uh, but the problem is, you know, the politicians we just swap onto one 
group of jokers for, for, for another one. And they're essentially the same. They're, they're all the, they, these people, they, you know, they may call them Republicans or Democrats, but they, their, their interests are more aligned with each other than with average Americans. You know, these people, they, yeah. they date each other, they marry each other, you know, they go to party together. You know, you guys yeah, seen and, the, the, and, the picture with Donald Trump and, and Hillary and, and Bill Clinton together. And they all go, all visit like Epstein's Island together, right? I mean, like- And they also, they also like Nikki Haley, will probably end up working for, you know, Raytheon or something here in the next few months or, She'll date someone and then divorce her husband and work for Raytheon. Uh, guys, I'm bringing up a couple of these comments on the screen here uh, because I think it's fair from time to time to bring up comments that uh, most people would like deleted. Uh, but this guy is very persistent or girl. I'm not sure who it is. This comment here has Putin has become a dictator and he uses fear, terror and fibs. It should come as no surprise that it attracts violence and hatred. That's the first comment. Here's the second comment. And I'm going to give this juicy one over to Carl. And uh, we'll come back to Angela in a moment. Don't believe a word these dictatorship worshippers say. I guess that's us, right? <laughs> For example, they are against respecting the free vote of people like in Taiwan against individual freedoms, etc. Who wants how, to dig their how, how about that respecting the free vote of people of Russia? They just voted. They just voted overwhelmingly for Putin. How does that make him a dictator? He used to have a election. He just had an election and he won. I mean, isn't that what democracy is about? I mean, like, because right now in the West, when we talk about democracy, what we're mostly talking about just the process, about just the electoral process voting. Well, Russia is definitely a electoral democracy. They they hold elections, and 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 so what is your criteria of democracy? Is because Russia is not a vassal state of of United States because Russia does not answer bid and call of Washington. I mean, uh, who who? Why would you want that? Why would you want to be the running dog of Washington, right? I mean, why would any self-respecting people want to be a vassal of of what? I mean, even Macron. Even when Macron said Europe shouldn't be a vassal to the United States, and he got attacked, he got attacked in major mainstream public of uh, 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 mainstream media in Europe and by European politicians for saying such such so, so non-controversial the stuff like like European shouldn't be vassal states to the United States. So what are you saying? You saying? Europe should be the vassal state to the United States. Russia and China should be vassal of the United States. Why? Why? Who voted? Who voted for the United States to be the global hegemon? Is the people of China or people of Russia or even people of Europe voted for Washington to be the arbitrator of the rule-based international order? No. Like Angel, like Angel said, that's not democracy. Democracy is, you know, people. You know, people have their own voice. People have spoke up in Russia, and 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 people in Russia have spoke up and said they want what they like. Putin, Putin is doing a good job. We like Putin to continue to do a good job. So how is that dictatorship? I mean, this is just yeah. you. You are just playing with words here now. Carl, you you are you familiar with the Levada Institute, right? The, you know this this polling polling agency, which is actually financed by the West. Well, the, the, the rating of Putin, according to this agency, is close to 80%. So this is a Western-sponsored, Western-funded institute that actually analyze the, you know, the, uh, you know, like uh, the favors that, that Putin has, you know, the, the support he has. So basically, it's in line with the results. In addition to that, this, this is for Russia. So basically, you cannot say it's even rigged. It's not rigged. Uh, and then, uh, and then, openly, uh, you know, when we look at the opposition, you know, it's this this opposition. Uh, but the opposition is probably even worse than what the collective West would want, because the the second biggest part is the communists. So that is for Russia. When it comes to China, for example, we all know that, and and not only by talking to people, but you know, you, the Howard Institute, you know, it, it says clearly that there's ninety to ninety five percent of support of the population for the CPC. But guess what? You know what? We don't even need to discuss about this. Why? 
Putin needs to be good for Russians. Why should it be good for Americans? Who the F are you to judge what is happening in Russia? If it's if it's bad, if you don't like it, who gives a shit, right? Who gives a shit? Russia needs to like him. It shouldn't be, you know, because, and, 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 and you know what Putin says? Because they ask him, oh, you know, they don't like him. And, you know, he, you know, Putin said, you know what? You're not my boss. I work for Russians. You need to find a leader that is going to be good for your own people and that delivers results. What we have in the West is an illusion of democracy, and we need to go back to the foundation. Sovereignty, but then the problem is it's, it's, it's a key element. It's a key element, really. The rules of the game need to be written by the people. What we have in the U.S. and in the West in general is that we, they, the, the elites, the 1%, they wrote the rules of the game. So now, let's say you and me, Carl, we are going to play a game. But I get to choose the rules of the game. But guess what? I'm going to make sure that you are going to lose all the time. And if people want to re-empower themselves, they need to write the rules of the game. And they don't want that. Because once, because they, you know, people realize they know it's it's all about the rule of the game. Once you 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 have a fair game, then everything changes. Yeah, well said, well said. Um, I mean, like the the, the the problem is like Eric Lee said in China, you cannot change the party, but you can change the policies. <laughs> in the U.S., you can change the parties, but you cannot change the policies. It's always the same policy, same agenda of screwing the poor and feed the rich. It's always a socialism for the rich <laughs> and, 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 and fuck the poor. And that, that, that has always been the program. Um, and, and now it's fucking everybody. And, and you know the, now now all these uh, the the lead in U.S. The, 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 they look at the rest of the American just as peons. You know, same thing. Like uh, they're no different than people from elsewhere in the world. They're all resources to be to the, where they can extract wealth from. Uh, so so this is why we we have a, a, a the, the decaying. Uh, U.S. Uh, as a state, you know, the, the impact, this is the, the positive. I, I'm always the, the, the glass is half full type of guy. So, so the positive outcome is U.S. is declining. <laughs> U.S. capability is eroding. The U, like, like John Mearsheimer, you know, he always said, it doesn't matter about intentions, all about capability. He was talking about China, but he is actually very correct about United States. It's, it doesn't about it's about capabilities. Right now, we need to destroy the capability of United States to cause mischiefs around the world. Because no matter what, some other jackass is always going to get in the office and, and cause problem. But but thankfully, there's there's so much self inflicted uh, pains on the United States that U.S. is losing its capability to to do much more harm. I mean, it didn't so much more progress needs to be done, but. Yeah, but you see, you see, Carl. I, I wish the best for Americans. I wish the best for every single person on Earth. What I'm saying is that though Americans are the first victims, it could, it didn't have to be like this, really. And it's not about uh, you win, I lose. You know, ni su It's not about this. It's about, you know, we have a, you no, know, world economy is a cake. You know, we can make the the cake bigger. You know, but if we are continuing, so, so you're 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 speaking you're speaking like a Chinese now, Angelo. But the I American know. elite, they don't they don't believe that. They they believe zero sum competition. They don't believe like giving oh, the cake could get bigger. No, the cake is all for me, none for you. <laughs> and and I do believe I do believe China, Russia, actually the the global South, they are not they are not going to. They really have this philosophy. Uh, this philosophy of because they have different concerns, they're not less ideology driven. It is about tangible stuff. They, they've been, you know, we are talking about people that have been starving, they've been contained. The reason they are where they are, it's because we've been stripping their resources, we've been containing them, bringing chaos. We didn't want them to, to build up because, because it's very mathematics. They are they have a bigger population. If they do well, they are going to surpass the West, and that's. That's you know obvious. Uh, it didn't have and, to and, be. And like the thing is, if you U.S. is blessed 
with abundant natural resources, yes. the perfect geopolitical, uh, the perfect geography with two oceans on either side. So U.S. don't really have to worry about invasions. So if U.S. actually apply itself on develop United States rather than you know trying to be the global hegemon, people in U.S. can still live very comfortably, very much well off. Even as China became the number one economy, people in United States can still be uh, live better lives, richer lives. Uh, but but that's not what <laughs> our elite have in plans. <laughs> they they want they, they they don't care about the rest of the Americans. They just want they want they just want more for themselves. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to ask a question here into the chat uh, section. Uh, just so you know that we have over three thousand two hundred viewers on tonight's show. Not bad, guys. Not bad. <laughs> Great. Good stuff. It's awesome. I'm just trying to keep up with the comments, but I did ask a question in the comments. Who do you think is behind this attack? Now, you're free to use some of examples like maybe, I don't know, the CIA or um, a terrorist organization or a certain government or whatever. You guys put it up there. We're going to bring it up on the screen here. I'm going to uh, dip back and let Angelo and Carl have the screen so I can focus. There's a lot of moving parts going on here, guys. And when you're the host of the show, you have to monitor a lot of these tens of thousands of comments. I think we went over, I think we're almost about 8,000 comments already. Uh, so I'm going to sneak in the backstage and I want to see you guys um, see what creative minds come up with here with a live show of over 3,000 people. Who do you think is behind these uh, attacks? Now, it could be funding it, uh, supplying the weapons, uh, maybe a country or uh, an organization, anything. Any other ideas you guys want to give them, uh, gentlemen? Uh, I'm going to let Angelo to take this one first because I... Oh, that's I, a tough I, one. It's, it's a spec... You know, I, you know it's the, that's the speculation. Uh, but, but, you know, we, we could do by elimination, actually. Uh, maybe maybe we could try by elimination. And, and I would say there's a lot of people that actually mentioned Mossad and the involvement of Israel. I, I would rule that out. I would rule that out because I think I do think that Israel has a much more pragmatic approach when it comes to the, this type of action. Israel is actually, I think Israel is hedging its best when it comes to the U.S. Uh, we see that uh, the Abraham Accord is part of it. But Israel is also common interest, very close interest with the, with the Russia. I mean, you know, it's what we call those strategic ambiguity. You engage, but by engagement, you have influence over countries as opposed to putting sanctions and going frontally. So when, when I look at Israel, and, and believe me, I'm anti-Zionist to the extreme, but I do believe that they are very pragmatic. Israel is also very close to China. They have project together it is actually preparing maybe it might be preparing for the world of tomorrow but it's not playing both sides it's still a u.s vassal state Let, don't get me wrong so i would rule out completely mossad out of this completely that's the first one uh isis i would say less we see the profile of those people they're not they are thugs uh they look much more actually much more to what we saw, the, the Georgians that were in Maidan, those mercenaries, you know, and uh, probably I would say, I would say Ukraine and, and uh, maybe some, some logistic help from, from the CIA. I would say you, uh, without the CIA, it might seem, it seems almost impossible. You, that's quite, so, they, we are talking about 11 people. Uh, they might need more, I mean, we know that Ukrainian uh, uh, secret services they they're quite in, you know immersed into into Russia, but I would say they might have needed a support. And at the the lead, the most passive would be uh, a tacit approval, uh, but that's speculation. It's not it's not an exercise I like. But uh, Carl, what did you take? I'm gonna be coy, and uh, I, I I'm pretty sure who did it. I'm pretty sure the w one um, organization or country that's behind the attack on Moscow concert, it's the same one that carry out the Nord Stream attack. <laughs> I stick by okay. that. I, I would say the same, actually. I would say the same. Uh, pretty much similar. 
It is. It is. Uh, I, I mean, to see the Nord Stream attack, you know, we, we, we don't know. We don't know who did it, but it's in a very he most surveyed uh, uh, area in the whole like Atlantic in, in that region. It's made, you know, since the time of Cold War, they have all kind of surveillance on the seafloor over there. And, 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 and and but it's possible, you know. Right now, you have mainstream media leaks trying to blame this on Ukraine after the same Seymour Hirsch expose, um, because they're like, no, no, Seymour Hirsch is crazy. So, but now they're trying to push out this uh, the idea of a bunch of ragtag uh, Ukrainian group carry out this very sophisticated attack in one of the world's most traffic and most surveyed seafloor. And expect us to believe that. I mean, uh, even if it was Ukrainian who carry out, we know who would who would train them, who gave them the green light, who allowed them to operate, and 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 probably provided the funding and equipment too. And this is my guess for the the, the recent attack in Moscow as well, because um, the people, the, the actual peons who are being captured right now. They might not be directly, you know, they, they might not be directly CIA, but, you know, their 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 backers, the people who ultimately provide provided the funding and, 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 and training and, 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 and logistics. And, and, you know, I, I don't I don't think you I don't think Ukraine government alone at this point has the capability to do that. I mean, like they need yeah. help. They would have need help outside help to to so so this is that's all i gotta say this is yeah but I, w I would add one thing actually uh, we may, well remember what happened with Nord stream did the collective west blame i mean let's say ukraine or i mean i think it would be easy to shift the whatever to give all the fault to ukraine the collective west you especially the one of the big the biggest victim was actually the eu they didn't blame even though now they're pointing the the fingers at jalozny right they uh, but you know he's, he's an easy target you know now he's out of the picture that's easy but they are still not blaming ukraine and guess what if maybe one day it, the news will come out that you know it's linked to ukraine and maybe vaguely the cia you know but will it make a difference those people they you know they 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 shift you know the news will appear but it's going to be like one second and people will forget but in reality uh, they won't blame that. That's that's how they play the game, and they, they they're willing to kill civilians. That's terrorism, but but, but because they're Russians, they, they they they'll change. You know, they, they'll be like they call them you know not terrorist victims, but but casualties. Yeah, I mean, you're you're not gonna see uh, Eiffel Tower getting light up with Russian flag. Okay, you're not gonna have people in the West saying we're all Moscovites now. Today we're all Russian, right? And that's not gonna happen. They're not gonna put up uh, lights on the Empire State Building, and you know, because there has to be a concerted effort in the West to dehumanize the Russian people. You know, they so so, so they're not even deserving. Of being mourned, of, of being uh, sending proper condol condolences, like like proper human beings. So so, but it doesn't matter because in the long term scheme of things, terrorism never could change the big picture. This is just like another the, the other terrorist attack uh, in the two early two thousands. In also there was a pre prior Moscow attack, a theater attack by the Chechen separatists. That did not alter the outcome of Chechen war. You know, Chechenia was pacified, and now it's a nice, clean place. Um, and 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 I, I believe same thing is going to happen to Ukraine because West can't even produce enough 155 millimeter artillery shells for Ukraine. You know, despite U.S. supposedly number one economy, despite the combined it does quote, industrial might of U U U.S. and Europe, they couldn't even provide, make something basic like 155 millimeter artillery shells. Why? Because that doesn't make money for the military industrial complex. This is this low margin stuff, you know, 155 millimeter shells. This is like, our, this is like almost commodity. They make more margin on expensive items like 
F-35, which it makes great submarine. And they, they, they make uh, the, 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 so, so, or, or like the Queen, uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth, which just, it's just having another fire just like uh, last weekend. And so, so this is, this is, a, this is, they purposely de-industrialize United States. So, so no matter U.S., Feds can print money all they want. They can type in, add in zeros on a computer, on a keyboard, you know, digitally add money. But that money is not going to buy you industrial production. That's that's something where China and Russia shines. You know, Russia is outproducing U.S. and Europe combined right now in terms of artillery shell production. And in the land war, guess what? Artillery is still the king, except now they have the added bonus of hooking up the drones with artillery so they have can have precision bombardment and, and this is what we see with the, with the ukrainian war where we where, where have dprk north korea with russia combined is beating the industrial production of entire europe and united states Oh, and we, we're not even mentioning China. Actually, China, if you were to look at the, the level of industrialization of China, it would be, I think it's, uh, it, it's it would be like Europe, uh, Europe, the US, and even India, and, and probably Japan too. I mean, the level is, is outstanding. Uh, but, but you know, this is, you just mentioned just before, you see the problem is that it's a it's culture problem. Uh, because of the financial economy, Financialized economy. It's it's just about printing money, and what we see is that you know all those positions in the GDP are all completely fake. So now you have the military. It's a uh, it's profit based, not purpose based. So you it's highly inflated. You have weapons that are high tech, but are, are worth nothing because it's not close to the reality. It's not for defense. Now the healthcare is the same. Healthcare in the U.S. is profit based, not purpose based. Healthcare, you're supposed to treat people, to make them live a better life. No, when it's profit-based, it's completely inflated. So healthcare in the US, in the GDP, it's 18%. China is 6%. Guess what? They live a longer life in China. This education. Is, uh... Yeah, education is the same. Actually, you know, education, the biggest US assets, you know what it is? It's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, student debt. 1.7 dollars. Can you imagine? Because education is profit based. It's not purpose based. You, you know what, uh, Angelo? I think U.S. today can best be described as techno feudalism. Techno feudalism, <laughs> because right now U.S. still have some high tech wonders, but it's all to deploy to extract resources from the workers in us like like what you all the example you listed education healthcare even the military industrial complex is created to extract rent from the rest of the americans and and so we are peons angelo we're peons and we're serfs we're serfs to give all our produce to our masters in washington and that's how they view the relationship with the rest of the world as well. You know, everybody, all are peon. Anybody who is not moving their circle, you know, who not who do not take vacation on Epstein's Island, you know, everybody else are just peons, serfs. And 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 you know, I don't know what to do about it, Angelo, because you know, I don't believe in the electoral process anymore. Last time I believed in it was in 2008 with the election of Obama because I thought, okay, he represented change, but he turned out to be the best president for the Wall Street. So, <laughs> and he was basically, he was basically the black face of the Wall Street. And, and, and now we're, we are here, 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 we are where we are. Uh, we, we get, we have another election coming up in U.S. and we get to choose either Biden or or Trump. <laughs> I mean, this is like deja vu. Didn't we just have? Didn't this just happen four years ago? And and this is why a lot of young people in the U.S. are also losing faith in the electoral politics, especially after the DNC screwed up, uh, screwed uh, uh, Bernie Sanders. So I I don't have great hopes for fundamental change in the landscape of U.S. unless something more drastic happens. I think there needs to be. I think there needs to be a century of humiliation for the U.S., no, for people I to truly wake up. Yeah, 
I think I, it's the pain I, I, level. I, I, the, the pain level. They, they, they haven't reached the pain level where people rise up. Because you, you see, I, I think, you know, I'm going to shock you. And I, and I shock myself when I say this. I First time in my life, I believe that the only... Uh, the only way is uh, arm struggle. I, I, and I, I never believe I will ever say that. Uh, they will not hand over the power and the only way is arm struggle. The problem arm struggle, you know what it means. You, you, you know Chinese history, arm struggle is devastating. But we are not. The problem is that they are limiting the level of pain. So you are going to be on a struggling, you are going to be on a survival mode as an individual, but you are not going to be willing to sacrifice your life. You know, it's... it's so I, and, 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 yeah, to, to draw but, a parallel to, 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 the, to China, I think we're like right now just before the Opium War. We're not even to, you know, there's still like a long stretch of decline from the 1840, from the Opium yeah. War to like, nine, to like 1949. There's like 100 years in between. We're just starting. We're just getting started, Angelo. <laughs> we are still at like, you're right. We're, we're like the, at the, uh, the point where they're boiling the frogs. But the water is just lukewarm, so people can feel the temperature rise. But it's still pretty comfortable. It's not like the, the water is not reaching boiling point yet. But you know, you know why why it's working. Actually, uh, when you look at the social engineering project that you have in the U.S., actually, this is a good way to divide and control people, and actually to. Uh, to better, uh, well, control in general. Well, you see, once you you erase completely the identity, you know, you destroy the 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 sense of uh, love, patriotism, uh, sense of family, uh, religion. Those are all fundamentals that make people strong. You fight. You know, people die for that. You know, they die for an ideal and so on. Now, when you have completely done this, finalized this deconstruction, people are completely isolated because it's a project of isolation you're not part of a community you are not part of a common uh common destiny as as a people you know why angelo that because that makes you the perfect consumer you know for anybody exactly. who watched the, who watched the fight club the movie you understand that you know because you feel the loneliness of being, being separated from your community you feel the isolation the only thing that to feed the kind of hollowness you feel inside is you can buy stuff. You can buy more stuff to, to make yourself feel better. You know, this is how, how the hyper uh, uh, capitalist society works. They want to atomize the society. They want to isolate the individuals so they can sell more products to you. You, you, you are the perfect. Oh, that's a beautiful. Exactly. Overcast, uh, it's beautiful. Oh, actually, this building, I remember the, this is the university. Is, is that the university or is it the, what is it? It's, that's a massive building. It's one of the seven sisters of Stalin. So during the oh. uh, Stalin's uh, 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 last years, they built like seven buildings like that in that style. And they all serve a different purpose. Uh, like one building is uh, currently is the home of a, a, a Russian foreign ministry. So that might be that building we're looking at. That might be the foreign. It's, uh, it's a Russian beautiful city. city. Amazing city. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I have well, to say, <laughs> it's been a fantastic two hours action packed here with Carl Zaw, with Angelo Giuliano. Gentlemen, Thank fantastic. You. I have to tell you, it's been very insightful as well. A lot to do behind the scenes here, but we're going to let you guys chat for the next couple of minutes here and you can enjoy beautiful sight here in Moscow. A little bit of a gray day, very understandable for the situation. Just before we head out, we'll read you one of the last uh, live updates from RT. A total of 107 people, including three children, remain in the hospital after the terrorist attack on the Crocus City Hall. Russian Deputy Minister Tatiana Golikova has said, adding that 15 of the patients are in extremely serious conditions. Our hearts and prayers go out to them with 42 in serious condition. The Moscow Regional Health Ministry previously reported that 121 people were injured as a result of the shooting, but said that 14 of them did not require hospitalization. It's been quite an eventful day here, gentlemen, and thank you once again. I will see you, gentlemen, backstage. We'll go to a full screen and uh, we'll let this fantastic audience uh, that has enjoyed us for a couple of hours chat amongst yourself. 
do not forget look below there you will see channels like carl zah daniel dumbrell angelo giuliano i chung ching reportify media yours truly and uh well we'll leave it at that guys how does that sound we'll talk to you guys soon backstage take care everybody